This conference will now be recorded. Welcome to Level 1, Lesson 1. And as always, everything that we're going to be talking about today is for educational purposes only, and nothing is intended as any type of investment advice. Okay, so I'm kind of, this is going to be a fun class for us because we're really going to focus on on actual trading itself. We talked about in the psychology uh, workshop the other day how, you know, knowing where a stock's going to go is pretty much is, you know, is not the easy part, of course, but it's really only one part of actually being able to get into a trade and get the correct entries and really know exactly what you're going to be looking to do. So today, what we're going to do the first uh, first class, we're going to go over our foundation of the things that we have to know first. OK, and when we're going to talk about our one through four trades, we're going to talk about the different types of trades and just basically do a refresher on that. But I also want to talk about some things that uh, and and ways to look at the prints and the psychology psychology behind the way that the prints are happening. Um, one of the things that I've noticed as of recently is there's just a lot of prints that are put into a style, into the chat room. And those prints themselves, although stand out, aren't really correct in a way of looking at the stock. And we're going to take care of that and make that perfectly clear just so we can kind of really understand the difference between prints at a level and actual controlling prints that we can base a game plan off of because every you know all prints at all controlling prints have to be prints at a level but at the same time not all prints at a level are going to be controlling prints so something that i definitely want to clear up then what we're going to be doing for the rest of our level one and level two we're going to be doing some uh doing some trading without any charts we're going to do that again because i know a lot of you have requested that we uh that we do a few classes this round doing that um and we're really going to just go out there and look for actual trades based off of everything that we've learned up until this point all right, so let's start off with what are the parts of a trade? What do we need to have in order to, to even think about starting and having a trade? You know, to this morning, this pre-market was one of the perfect examples of how you could have some beautiful movements, but you don't actually have any type of, of real game plan to be able to set, be set up yet. Um, so volume, controlling prints, okay. Okay, so first of all, can we have a trade without controlling prints? So number one is going to be our controlling prints. Without those, we cannot set up a game plan. Okay, that's going to be allowing us to know how to use our calculations, our expectations of pullbacks and pull-ups. It's going to really allow us to know almost every aspect uh, and in general of what the stock should look like on the chart. Okay, print personality. Why is print personality so important? I know we have a few new people in here this uh this round, why are print personalities so important? Can we make a calculation without really knowing what the market maker is typically doing out there? To know how that's exactly, and it really needs to know how to interpret those controlling prints. If it's at print personality, we're not going to expect the same type of trade if it's way over print personality. It's going to determine the type of trade that we're going to be looking to do. OK, so sometimes, you know, and it's you know perfectly fine if you're new to this and, you know, you haven't really um, experienced a lot of things. You know, it's just you see some questions like, you know, should I be looking for a number one trade? If a stock is, let's say, dollar eighty, are we ever really going to be looking for a number one trade in a stock that's a dollar eighty? No. It's just not going to happen because, first of all, if we're looking at a stock that's a dollar eighty-five, more than likely it's going to have very high volume, right? And if something has very high volume, what does that mean for the amount of time it's going to take them to build that type of trade? It's going to be a lot quicker of a build. So we just basically know if the stock's that cheap, it's not even something that should even go through our mind. Okay, we're going to also today we're going to do some examples of just looking at the stock and trying to understand what type of trade we'd be looking for. Okay, so we have our controlling prints and we have our print personality. What else? Volume is a given. Remember, any type of trade, volume has to be a given. If it doesn't have volume, we can't trade it, right? So range is going to be a variable that comes into it. Okay, so range is because, you know, depending on the stock, range might be relevant, range might not be relevant. So that's always going to be a variable that we look at. Yeah, our increments. What are our increments? Well, it's very simple. The platform does it for you. So when we look over here, we can see, okay, 
what is this stock trading? What I want to do is I want to just to add, include the entire pre-market. What increments is BRPM trading? This thing's just it's making a tear. It's trading in 50 cent increments. So what does that tell us about print personality? If the stock is at print personality, how much can we assume that person needs to make? Fifty cents. Okay, so if our print our prints are at fourteen fifty, we expect our pullback, and from that pullback, we'd expect the stock to be in the, in the vicinity of fifteen dollars. Okay, what it's telling us is that each each time as a market maker prints at print personality, they're expecting to make an increment. Okay, and you, this isn't something that you have to calculate yourself. You literally just include the entire day. So there's something about increments that I want to bring up right now. Okay, typically a stock like BRPM, once the market opens, is it still going to trade this way? Yeah, so we can't say no, but probably not. So one thing that you don't want to get caught up is if, in is if a stock, once its stock opens up in like, let's say 930, and it starts, you know, kind of just trading in like a 20 cent range, 25 cent range, you're not going to be able to use the same increments because these increments are going to be calculated based off of this crazy move. Okay, if a stock changes its personality, the increments it's actually trading are will change themselves. So in a case like that, what we would do is we would come, you know, once the market actually opens, we would just zoom and we take out a large portion of that because now it's going to give us a better idea of what the stock is actually doing. It's very easy to click, especially in the morning and the morning, right? You know, as the market opens, it's very easy to get caught up on something that happened crazy, you know, crazy during the pre-market. That isn't really what the stock itself, the stock's personality is anymore. For instance, a great example is DKNG. Oops. Because when we look at DKNG right here and its increments, what is the entire increments it's trading based on right now? Yeah, these, this huge initial move from 47 to 53, that's a $6 move, but we can not expect the stock to move in, in that large of increments because that was kind of a one-off situation. One-off situations don't help us really understand how the stock itself is going to be trading. So that's something that you have to be paying attention for and attention to and be looking for when you pull up a stock because then again, exactly, it's gonna be completely skewed. Okay, it's the same type of deal with a range. Okay, if range is, you know, uh, 206, but today's volume, can we expect more than 206 on average for a move in DKNG today? We absolutely can. So this $2.06 range really doesn't have much relevance in what we'd be looking for in this trade specifically. So these are just a few things that you have to understand because an average is just that. It's an average of whatever we're looking at. So when something happens that's completely out of character, it's either going to make that 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 average irrelevant or it's going to completely skew it. And should we move the chart over to eliminate that bar for accurate increments? No, because guess what? Can, can DKNG open up and all of a sudden have great move and great movement and have those really big bars and and trade let's say twenty dollars today? Can that happen? It absolutely could. So we don't want to just get rid of it until the stock shows us that it shouldn't be there anymore. You know, we want to know that exact info. But <coughs> if it's not trading with those, those giant bars, what can we assume? Because right now we know it's trading in dollar increments, right? So if it's trading in dollar increments at this moment, what can we assume once the more? Yeah, we could assume it's going to be less than a dollar, right? And the next the next increment that would fit into that would be 50 cents. It's not going to trade in 75 cent increments. It just doesn't work that way. So we can assume that it's you know it's going to be lower if we don't start to see those really big, you know, really huge movement. Okay, makes sense. Okay, so we need our controlling prints. We need print personality. Okay. We need to know what our increments are. And essentially, those three things are what's going to give us the ability to understand when we see prints what it should do. 
Now, what are the parts of a trade we need to have before we can actually enter? Can you guys hear me? Check, check. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what just happened. <clears throat> okay, yes, so we need to have an entry, an exit, the price target, and a stop loss. Without those, we cannot have an actual game plan. So how do we figure out what our price target should be? Let's start there. Because without a price target, can we really know how much we're willing to lose? Can we really know how much we're willing to lose if we do not have a price target? Oh, I'm scrolled up. No, because we need to know what the market maker has to do in order for us to understand what we're going to do. Exactly, we need that risk first reward. Okay, so if our price target is 50 cents, how much can we lose? At a max. And I know it falls in the middle, but remember, we have a one to four, one to five ratio. Okay, if a stock is going to move a dollar, we can lose 20 to 25 cents on that trade. Anything else just doesn't really work out. Okay, so if, for instance, we just saw these huge bid prints. Okay, huge bid prints just came into DKNG, right? Okay, what does that tell us the stock should go? Tells us up than down, but let's say, okay, so we, we know, so think about it this way, okay? We're, we're gonna be talking about actually trading a stock right now. Is this over print personality, those bid prints? Way, way over, right? So what that tells us is that the stock, if it's trading right now in those dollar increments, because technically we're still, you know, it, the market just opened, we're technically st trading in those dollar increments. Can we trade this for a number, the number three? And the answer would be yes, because that's way over print personality. And the answer, and it's also, it's got a huge range today. So we know the pull up isn't going to be 25 cents. It's not going to be 50 cents. We can expect a large, large pull up from those prints that we just saw. So we have to understand something. If we, let's just say the stock was at 51, okay? And those happened at 50. A okay? technically pull, but pull up should happen very quickly, right? So if we're at 50 and we're at 51, where does our entry have to be at a maximum? What's the maximum that our entry could be? Because we'd be going long on a number three trade. What would the maximum we can get in be if our expectations were for it to go to 51? Fifty twenty-five. Okay, so yes, I understand the fact that because it's so far over print personality, we could expect it to go higher than fifty-one. But let's just say, so if we know it had to move up a dollar, our entry would have to be basically at fifty twenty-four. Why fifty twenty-four and now fifty twenty-five? Why 50-24 and now 50-25? We don't trade at zeros and fives. Remember, it's good. you're going to have a harder time getting filled. So 54 is where you'd put it. You never want to be in at an 05 or at a 00. So based off of having our price target, we now know what our stop loss has to be. We now know what our entry has to be. 
all right? Now, our exit. Do we know where our exit is when getting into a trade? <clears throat> so I have a yes. An idea of one, okay. Does the price target mean an exit? No, it doesn't. So we have a price target for where the stock has to go, but does that necessarily mean it's an exit? Do we just get out to get out of a stock? Nope. So one of the things that we have to understand is our exit. We don't know our exits yet. Okay, and I'm gonna be talking about something about prints in a second. That's gonna kinda, of, so how do we exit? Now let's say this stock goes up to, goes up to 51, but now it's, you know, it goes to 51.64, jumps up high. Would I just get out at 51 to get out at 51? Absolutely not, because that, that would just be, you know, there's no reason to do that. So how do I now start to decide where my exits are going to be? So new info, absolutely. There's an even easier way to go about it. If I'm in and it's at 51.64, if it pulls under 51.50, is that a good spot to take off? So the answer is absolutely. You have set increments where there's going to be a certain amount of profit that you're not willing to lose. Because how do you actually make money trading? Is it the stock going up while you're in it? Or is it when you actually realize, realize shares? Obviously, it's when you actually trade and you realize your profit. So this is something that I want to talk about because this is exactly what market makers do. So when we come up and we're, let's say, 5170, so let's just say 70, I'm just making up numbers here. But if it's going to break past 5150, I'm going to take a portion of my stock off. The reason being, is it worth it to let it come down to 51 and give up 70 cents of my profit? Is that a good way to go about trading? Absolutely not. Because what we want to do is we want to make sure that as the stock, if it's, you know, if we're up and it's 53, we're not going to let it come down to 51 to then get back up to 53, even the prints say so. Because why wouldn't I do something like that? Why wouldn't I do, why wouldn't I let it go to 53 to come down to 50? Yeah, because statistically speaking, I'm going to get a new entry. And when I lock in that, that money up here, and then once it comes back down, I can always just get back into it. I'm not going to let something give up that much, that much of a profit. Now, I want to talk about the psychology of a market maker for a second. How do market makers trade? How do these market makers trade? Do they let it come down to 51 and then go back up to 53? No, not a day trader. They trade the exact same way. They literally trade the exact same way I'm telling you. If the stock goes up to 53, what do the computers do when it comes down to 52? We see it all the time. What are the computers going to do? Why do they, why do they take off? And I'm not saying they take off the entire position, but they, when they take off, why am I saying that they take off? So it's not necessarily that, it, well, I mean, it definitely is part of partly limiting exposure, but it's also a big part of it is the fact that think about what their actual position is. Think about how big their position is. So if the stock's only got to, they're going to 55, they're going to scale out at certain points as it comes back down. Now, if the stock just goes up to straight to 55, are they going to scale out just for the hell of it? 
depending on how big the position is, but not really. It's always going to be on a spot where the stock comes back down. So this is why I see a lot of the times when a stock is in an uptrend, and let's just use a better stock. It doesn't look like anything's in an uptrend. <laughs> uh, do, do, do. We could use a downtrend, it's just gonna be the opposite. Uh, do, do, do. Okay, uh, oh yeah, OCGM, perfect. Okay, so in this case right here, okay, we get buying at 1250, right? So as it was coming up, you get buying at that 1250. What's going to happen is on its way down, they would be selling. That's where they would limit their exposure. They don't typically limit when it's coming up. They're going to limit as it kind of makes that pullback coming in. Now, why are they going to limit their exposure when it makes that pullback? There's a reason behind it. Yeah, they're basically taking more from retail. Because they, you know, they're as the stock comes back down. So this is one of the things I see all the time. If I see selling an OCGN right now at 1250, would I call it out? Unless it was something like ridiculous. But if I saw selling an OCGN, would I call it out? No, I wouldn't. Because is that, are those prints for me to follow? Like I said, I see it all the time. Yeah, it's not something to follow. It's just part of them trading. This is how trading works. Because this stock right here, does it have enough buying to go to 13? without a shadow of a doubt, right? So when it comes back down to that 1250, okay, on that way down, trying to file and saying, okay, well, there's 1250 bid prints looking for a trade there is, is not something that you can do. So I've talked about this before. When I want to follow prints, do I want to follow ask prints on an uptrend, bid prints on a downtrend, or bid prints on an uptrend, or and ask prints on a downtrend? Which ones do I want to follow? exactly with the trend because what is that telling me the psychology behind these prints what is that telling me there we go they're new positions it's new buying it's you know on a downtrend it's new selling so if there's new positions coming in near those highs what's that telling me the stock eventually needs to do so we have new buying as it comes in as it's on its way up that's telling me overall the stock it doesn't mean it doesn't need to pull back a little bit first but it is telling me that the stock eventually needs to go higher so we don't want to follow big opposite side a permanent print to the opposite side of a trend unless like i said it's something that really stands out because if they came down at 1250 right now and sold, you know, 5 million shares at 1250, is that important? Well, the amount of buying this, it might not even be, but you understand the, the theory behind it? <laughs> because what that's, that's something that's, I mean, that's just gigantic. Someone's bailing on it. Okay, but overall, when we want to look for our controlling prints, because remember, controlling prints are the number one thing that we need on any stock in order to really be able to set a game plan. If we're following them, okay, you know, having, um, you know, especially like this morning in OCGN, this morning when it was going, it, it came up and it pulled back down a little bit right here. And I saw someone call out like 1150 bid prints or something. And those prints, yeah, they're bid prints there, but it's not really telling you anything. This makes sense to everybody. We have to understand that the psychology behind why things, why it's actually happening. Because otherwise, if what's going to happen if you get caught trying to follow prints that aren't followable, that you can't follow? I don't think followable is a word, but you understand what I mean. What's going to end up happening? You're going to have an extremely bad time, and you're going to constantly get shaken out. 
So it's very important to follow things that are adamant. Now, another thing that I see, okay, what's the print personality right now in OCGN? I'd say give or take five. When a stock is trading this much volume, okay, and I get five prints on the ask or the bid, is that something I can follow? The answer is no. Why is the answer no? Yes, in a cheaper, especially a cheaper stock. But I mean, it really doesn't matter what stock it is. It, you know, it could be a cheap, regular stock. It could be a cheap stock, you know, 20s, 40s or anything like that. You need to see somebody that's dominant. And when I say dominant, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be way over print personality, but you want to see someone that's adamant about what they're looking for. A great example is when we started before and in a, um, right after our morning meeting, remember we got like three prints that came in at 3.30? I don't know if you go when we were talking in our me uh, meeting, we got about three prints that came in at 3.30. Now, if we looked at the print personality during that time period, it was really one or two. So three prints was technically over, but a stock that's moving this much, can we base a trade off of three prints? No. So even though technically it was off print personality, it's just not enough to really show us anything. Especially because this stock came from all the way up here from, you know, let's call it 38 and came back down. And then the ask prints came on the way back up, right? So someone might be sitting there saying, okay, well, this stock needs to go back up above 30, but that's not going to be the case. If you try to trade that way, you're going to get burnt way, way, way too often. Okay, these are just some things that we, you know, going into the rest of the classes that we're going to do, we have to understand. Okay, there's certain things that we can't follow, even though they're prints at the actual level. It's making sense to everyone so far? So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, on, on just explaining it because there's a workshop that you could go back to and, and we'll go over, but I wanna just clear up one through four trades. Um, I always thought prints at print personality are fine to follow for two and number four trades. So not, it depends, it, it, it depends on the stock itself. Okay, when with WBX and you have a stock that's showing this, okay, if, if this was gonna go back up, it's got, it got such a big range. Are we only gonna see three prints at 30 for a stock like this? Really, what should your minimum number be on how many controlling prints you need on any stock? What should your minimum number be? Now there's exceptions, but guess what? Unless your percentages are, are you know where you want them to be, you shouldn't be following exceptions. But yeah, the number's four. So if you get three prints, you might want, but they're just, it's not, it's not something you could follow, especially considering the fact WBX, if this was going to go back up to 35, that's a $5 move. So they're going to trade, they're going to trade there. You're going to see more than that come in because it's going to be adamant. They're going to be adamant about it. You'd also see a lot of off-level prints coming back over there, but it just, unfortunately, if it's not there, it's not there. Stock like this, it looks so pretty on paper, and a retail trader will be glad to hit the button on this, but it's not something we can duplicate day in and day out. And everything that we do is to be consistent. Okay, we, We're not looking to, you know, to, to hit a home run once, once every three months and the rest of the time get shaken out. We're looking to follow things that are showing us exactly what they need to do. So just to go over quickly, the number one trade is ask prints way over print personality. Okay. Pull back, uh, pull back trade. So a short. Number two, okay, prints at print personality. Okay, pull pull up, and then a short trade. Number three, okay, prints bid prints above way above print personality. Expect a big move, a big building move. So a long to the upside, and then a number four is ask prints. Okay, uh, at print personality or around print personality pullback and then the long trade towards the actual prints. Okay, I hope everyone's clear on that because I'm gonna be using those numbers throughout this entire class. 
Okay, and if you're not clear, then uh, there's a workshop where it literally goes over them in detail. Make sure that you get the, you know, get that done because this is, you know, something that you do need to know. So now I want to start to look at trades for a second and understand what type of trades we'd be looking to take. Okay, I'm going to start. Let's we can just go through a scanner, but I'm going to start with something like RDBX. Okay, and I want you to understand something. Think you can think. I don't care if it's if it's shortable or if it's it's hard to borrow or not hard to borrow. We're going to assume in every stock that I pull up that we're able to go either long or short in it. Okay, what type of trades in this stock would be acceptable? Forget prints, forget anything else. What type of trades would be acceptable in this stock? What number of trades would be acceptable in a stock like RDBX? So remember, okay, it, it, it's both, thing you're, it's not hard to borrow, it's both. What type of trades would be acceptable? We got one and three, we got two and four. What does everyone think? I want you to think about this. Two and three. Thank you, Tim. All of them. Okay, look at this stock right now. Okay, look at the range that's in it. Look at the moves both when it goes up, the moves both when it goes down. Okay, any prints that we see, can we set up a game plan using those prints in a stock like this if it will, if it's not hard to borrow? Because obviously if it's not hard to borrow, then you know, you're know you looking at three and four. But, but do you see a stock with a personality like this, I can do either or. It's both showing me great moves. I mean, if we go back down here, look at these. If this was shortable, look at these ass prints at 25. Did it give us a nice trade to the downside from those ass prints at 25? Sure did. Okay, we've got our moves up. We've got, you know, it, it's it basically encapsulates all of it. Now, most of the time, if you have a stock with a big range, you're going to be able to use almost any number of any of the number of trades. Unless what? Like, I'm going to give you an example of. Let's just pull up NVAX. Now, I know the volume's not great, but this is, the, I want you to understand something. What number of trades could we use in this? So, why do I say, well, why would I say one and two? Why can't we take any uh, pull up trades or long trades in it? So it's not necessarily that it has a downtrend because if it had just had a downtrend, what does that tell us eventually should happen? Not reverse, but we should get a kind of real back to reality, right? A real nice pull up trade all at once. If a stock just goes straight down, guys, can a stock go straight down forever? Can a stock go straight down forever? Well, I guess technically it could go to zero, so yeah, it could. But stocks don't typically just go straight up and straight down. Okay, and exactly what Trevor said is that if you look, how long does any type of pull-up trade actually last in the stock? Besides maybe one that I can see, which really, I mean, you know, it was iffy. But besides really one, if you tried to take a pull-up trade in this stock, what happened to you? Got burnt. So if the personality shows that it's not giving that to you, you can't expect it to just out of nowhere. We were going to follow the actual personalities. So that's the so it's, so it's not trend. Okay, don't get me wrong. It's not just trend because then that would you know. That would tell us that everything that we would just have to trade to the downside on a stock going down. That's not the case. Okay. It's personality and trend. Does that make sense? You know, WBX is another great example of what we're just talking about. I mean, the range is absolutely phenomenal. But at any point here, except for the beginning of the morning, was there really a great trade that came into it? 
Do we really see any great pull? Well, this is a little bit different because look at the 20 level. 20 is going to be hard to hold. A uh, little bit different, but still same type of deal. Okay. If we look, most of the time, if the stock looked like it was going to pull up, it did not. And it continued on its way down. So its personality is showing that because it's got great range, we know that if it wanted to pull up, that we could get a great trade coming into it. It's just showing us that it doesn't really have those pull-up trades. Now, don't get me wrong. It's 9.55. We're still very early. Okay, what time do we expect stocks to start to, to kind of, if they're going to change what their, their, their personality, what time do we typically look at? Basically, from anywhere from 9.50 to 10 o'clock is really where we're going to look. So we're kind of in that area right now. But once it gets like a little bit past 10 o'clock, more than likely, it's going to follow, you know, a lot, pretty much to the same personality that we've seen coming into it. All right, let's do a few more examples. Um, do, 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 do. Let's look at Futu. What are we thinking? What numbers? One, two, three, four, all of them. So I got a one and two and a two and four. <laughs> so let's think first. Okay, the reason I pulled this up, I know the volume's not great. Yes, it's overlapping bars because the volume's not great, but there's something that I'm going to, and that's the answer, I wouldn't trade it, but there's something that I want you to keep in mind that it just wasn't a good spot for me to use that as an example. Okay, right now, I wouldn't be looking to go long in it, right? Because it doesn't really show any pull-ups. But what if it came to 70? What if it came to 70? Why 70? Yeah, it's a big psych level. When you have a really great trend, a trend in a stock, where's typically a great spot to look if it's going to change? Our psych levels, right? I mean, this one only got to 740, but you know, when we look at these type of stocks, if I see a really great trend in something and it's coming to an actual psych level, it's always a great spot for to look for that trade. Can you explain why we wouldn't trade until 70? So I didn't say we wouldn't trade it. In, well, we technically wouldn't trade this at all, but I didn't say we wouldn't trade it till 70. Okay, but as of right this second, what kind of trade would I be looking for? One and two or two and four, three and four? one and two, unless it came down to a psych level, because then from there, that's always a great spot for something to, you know, to turn around. For instance, if I would have just taken this trade to go to the long side, I'd be, you know, I'd probably be getting shaken out right now because we'd be looking for the pull-ups just don't last long enough. <laughs> there's, there's no actual continuation on the pull-ups. So I'm not going to try to fight it. It's like trying to fight gravity. There's no point to it. But if it came to 70 on a great trend like this, 70 is a good spot to look for a change because it's a psych level. So it's not, it's not that I wouldn't be looking to trade it. It's I wouldn't be looking to trade it against what it's showing me until it came to that specific point. Understand? When a stock is going to buck a trend, best spots are to look for the psychological levels. Pull under 70 a little bit. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen to retail once they pull it above 70. What's retail going to do once they pull it underneath 70 and then they bring it back and give them movement above? They're going to buy, right? Remember, 70 is a psychological number. So if they pull it under 70, now it starts to get an uptrend back up. 
retail is going to look to buy. All right, let's go to let's do OCGN. What kind of trade would I be looking to take in OCGN right now? One, two, three, four. So we got an all of them. What does everyone think? So why is that? So we do have the prints. We have gigantic ask prints at 1250. Really great buy at 1250. Why would I not be looking to trade this to the downside? There's a specific reason. Well, a couple of reasons actually. So, but let's even say if it was up here, even if it was up here right now, and we, we didn't have this little consolidation right here, why would I still not be looking to trade it to the downside? So take out consolidated for months because that, I mean, that is, that is a true point, but let's say we didn't know that. Okay, what do we notice about the volume in the stock? It's huge, right? Now, if this stock decides to break out, What's going to happen? Is it going to look like, you know, a little bit of a move to the upside? Or are we going to get like a huge, almost like a uh, news bar that would come into this type of stock? Which one would make more sense? Or be more likely, rather? A bar to rip my face off. So can I control that? If I, let's say, I were to short it, is it worth the, the 30 or so cents? Back to the 12 level for me to short this when a bar could just out of nowhere go then pop up to 1280. Is it worth that? Is my risk versus reward versus the possibility here? A, you better be right, bar, pretty much. But do you see how, even though, yes, would there be money to make on a pullback from 1250? There's a, there's a little bit there, but is it worth your risk versus reward? So even though technically, could I trade this to the downside or a number one trade? Technically I could, but I probably wouldn't. Because of the fact that that bar would just destroy everything. It's not a high percentage trade with all those prints sitting up here at 1250, this amount of volume, because we know it doesn't take a long time for them to actually build. Do you see what I mean? So. There's a difference between technically can something happen and trading it and the actual trade itself. Does that make sense to everybody? You see this bar right here would have just knocked out most of your profit. Because by the time you got in, it's gonna be somewhere around, you know, at 1250 area. And look at it, look at this, this is one of the biggest bars that we've had since that consolidation. It's just, it's not, it doesn't suit for what the stock is showing us, that type of trade. Would this stock also have been, would it been, uh, if it only pulled back 10 cents and then moved up, would that have been something that, that shocked anybody? No, right? Because look at how much it's been building. Okay, we know from yesterday, we know there's probably buying sitting up there based off of everything we have, but this is a number four trade all day long. <laughs> and obviously, as we're, you know, as I'm explaining this, it's just gave us just a beautiful, beautiful number four trade. But does everyone see why? So even though the great ass prints at 1250, I'm not looking to short it. Even though aspirants at 12.50 tell us what? Stock needs to pull back first. But do you see how when you take everything into else into account, it really in no way whatsoever should have been a number one trade? And it wasn't. <clears throat> 
this is what I'm talking about, that sometimes you have, you know, you have these setups and yeah, because most people see big ass prints at 12.50 and want to think number one, but we can't do that. We have to think logically of what the stock is looking to do. Okay, make sense? Let's see. Let's look at let's look at plug. What do we think here? So one and two, because it's close to 35 and it's at its range. Don't disagree. Look at volume. Or can we expect for it to hit volume? It's average volume. It's actually over its range. So really, what kind of trade would be perfect here? Because it's technically that would a two kind of work maybe, eh, but what would it, what would the problem with a two trade be right now? What would the problem with a two trade? We just talked about this. In order to take a two trade, what kind of prints do we need to have? Bid prints. So do we want bid prints on a stock that's trending up like this? Do we want to follow those? No, why not? Mm -hmm. Yep. So at the end of the day, really, all that we could have done is if we would have got great ass prints over 35. So really, a number one trade was was you know, the right, correct trade to make here. Now, what happens if we would have got decent ass prints at 35? Could this become a four trade? So what are the numbers? So technically, the two trades are what? One and four. See how this works? You know, it doesn't mean that a two trade, it can't print bids and eventually come back down, but do you see how for our situation in our trading right this second, it just doesn't fit? Because it's on that uptrend, in order to really get bids at that 35, it would have to come, you know, just go a little bit over, then come down at that 35, then there's just, it's, it's, it's it does, just doesn't fit. So one in four would really be the only things that fit for that to make any sense for us. All right, let's see what else we got. Let's do a couple more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm PHUN. Remember, we're looking at these things as if they're they're shortable. What numbers? One, two, three, four, and five. Two. Why two? What's the problem with a three trade? So I want you to look at the psychology of this chart for a second. We got to ask Prince this morning at 750, right? Is this pullback warrant this amount, the amount of prints we saw at 750 for this thing to come all the way back up to 750 today? Were those enough prints to warrant that happening? No. So really any type of what looks like a trigger to the upside is more than likely them doing what?
well, covering or getting retail, right? It's just too far of a pullback when we come into this. So really what we want to see is bid prints, a pull up from bid prints, and then, and, and then take our trigger back down. And why in number two? Because look at how big the volume is. These moves up shouldn't take a long time because of the fact that it's trading such a large amount of volume. So a trade to the upside in this, it's so easy to get caught Okay, when you get these little moves up and then you end up getting that bar that comes back down. There is a ton of buying on the way down. Does that change anything? Well, it depends what your definition of a ton is. Like right here, 489, what was that more than likely? Well, definitely a computer. I would agree with you there. More than likely covering. Remember what we want to look for when a stock does something like that. Okay, this isn't enough, okay, to change it into actual buying based off of you know how the trend and everything that we saw coming back down. So we want two phases. We want to see covering coming in, but then buying following that covering. In this case, unfortunately, we just don't see that. And now is five an easy level to break and hold up above? No, that was definitely a computer. What's the problem on it was with a stock after a short squeeze? Usually comes back down pretty hard. So when we're looking at this coming in here right now, guys, yeah, I see movement. It's moved up, but do I care? Does it fit my my what I need to do to be consistent day in and day out? This is what you guys, some people just don't, I, I mean, it's hard to kind of understand sometimes, but it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the movement. It doesn't fit what happened. So number, if it's not a number two trade, I'm not going to trade it. It doesn't fit yet. Look at all the new selling that's coming in now. Okay, this is one of those situations where it becomes very hard to be consistent when you try to trade things like this because you end up getting in. By the time you got in, it would probably be you know somewhere around here, right around that 80 spot. And how easy is it for this stock to just bar right back down to where it was? You see what I mean? So yeah, that looked like a ton, but it really wasn't. I mean, it is, don't get me wrong, it's a lot, but in comparison, okay, if we come over here and we look at our daily and we look at the top all the way up here and we look at the volume for that day and then we look at the volume for today, okay? How many people do you think are short in comparison to how many people have covered today? You know, we can't be worried about, you know, about trades that just don't fit what we're looking for. You know what I'm saying? So overall you know number two is what fits especially these cheaper stocks that make these little pushes that come into them they they burn people big time all right guys do we have any questions I have a question. When we were looking at NVAX around 950 Eastern, you said a number four trade was in considered time of day. Wouldn't it be where there could be a trend change? Um, hold on, let me look. Around 950 Eastern time. Uh, you said a number four trade was not a consideration, but considering time of day, would it be the time where it could be a trend change? It technically would have been, but it's when we were looking at NVX, yeah, it technically would have been a time that that could happen. But look, look at how many of these actual triggers themselves wouldn't have shaken you out. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's trading 9.2, you know, thousand shares a minute. So, you know, it's, I was just talking more about the example of the volume. I mean, the bars themselves. Um, but yeah, I mean, it definitely, you're talking about that 10 o'clock point between 9.50 and 10 o'clock. It's just, it's not something I would have been looking for. Do you understand what I mean? And I mean, and um, the, once again, we go back to the volume. It, we wouldn't be looking for it anyway, but. All right, guys. Uh, remember, Traders Exchange at 1230. We'll talk to everyone in the chat and happy trading.